Um, you know, because I love language so much and it means so much to me, I usually customarily begin these types of talks wherever I am, thinking about the indigenous people. This is Mawakwa Ohlone land. There were eight languages spoken along <coughs> this peninsula, stretching all the way down to Monterey. So uh, in respect, uh, I would like to invoke their spirit now. Um, so I've been accused of being a schizo curator. That's a very weird word. I mean, when that first happened, um, I didn't think much of it, because I get accused of a lot of different things. Um, but this was a friend of mine. His name is Frederick Young, and he teaches at UC Merced. He's in the literature department. He teaches theory. And uh, he was referring to the work of Guy Deleuze, and uh, specifically a book called Anti-Oedipus. And in this book, uh, Felice Guattari and, and uh, Deleuze uh, make an attack on Freud. And they also make an attack on the psychology of capitalism and uh, the limits of, you know, I think the human spirit under those constraints. So, um, you know, to really explain this story, I think I have to kind of go back a little bit. I have to go back about 100 years uh, when a man by the name of Lawrence Ferlinghetti was born, because without him, I probably would not be here and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, he lived a very Dickensian life uh, from being mm, lower middle class to being poor to being kind of well off for a while and then sort of being poor again. Uh, and then later, um, joining the military, he was a naval officer. A lot of people don't realize that. He actually served in World War II. And he was running sub-chasers along the eastern seaboard. Later, he was sent to uh, <coughs> Normandy uh, for the D-Day invasion. And it was there that he photographed, there was a dark room on board his ship, he photographed the Doughboys hitting the beach. And he saw a lot of people not come home. Uh, and this had a very big impact on him. Uh, later, a bunch of troops were heading to Paris and somebody said, okay, you're on leave. So he found this broken down Jeep with a buddy of his and they fixed it up and they went on the road and it broke down. And so these, two women in a jalopy drive by and say, hey, you know, American, and sort of embrace them and say, you're coming with us. You're coming to the town of Charbourg. So it was in the town of Charbourg that sitting in a cafe, and back then, you know, like kind of now, you know, some cafes, you know, they have like paper tablecloths on the tables. Somebody had scrawled a poem, and it was signed Jacques Prévert. And so Lawrence folds it up, puts it in his pocket, takes it with him back on the ship, and of course translates this. Uh, one of the great things about his childhood is that he learned both French and English. So uh, he was no stranger to the French language. Um, so later he was sent to the Pacific Theater where he was on a troop carrier and he was navigator, and they were heading towards Tokyo. But they were told just as they had got there that the war was over. Now, we have to understand at that point, no one really knew what an atomic bomb was. I mean, you know, there were little bits and pieces coming through about the Manhattan Project, but no one really understood the full extent of what had been built. Uh, so he got on a train with a bunch of other officers and was told, oh, go visit this little town and describe to us what you see. So the town was Nagasaki. And usually the photographs that you see of Nagasaki are after everything's been cleared out. What they saw was very shortly thereafter. And the way Lawrence has described it is as mulch, where the animate and the inanimate have fused together. Now this is where his political life came alive at that moment and began asking a lot of questions. A lot of what we do, a lot of what I do, is about asking the right questions. Um, recently, the uh, CEO of Cambridge Analytica was secretly recorded in a video where somebody was kind of asking, they're all drinking, and somebody asked him, hey, you know, are you worried about your, your you know, Senate subcommittee hearing? And he's like, oh, no, no, no. They won't know the right questions to ask. Um, this is a very interesting moment. Because then these are the kinds of moments that, that Lawrence Ferlinghetti and that City Lights has always been curious about. Because they hold some very powerful meanings. 
So we're about asking the right questions, and we're about getting everyone thinking about these issues. So uh, later, when Ferlinghetti left the military, he continued his studies. He wanted up the Sorbonne, and his paper was about the poetic experience in relation to the city. What can you experience in a city? Uh, and then he also did a paper on the Gothic um, in art. But later, he wound up really kind of just sort of like a flaneur running through Paris and discovering George Whitman, who later became a lifelong friend. George Whitman had a bookstore. At that time, it was called Mistral Books. Later, it was to become Shakespeare and Company. Uh, this had a huge influence on Lawrence. He said, wow, I want a bookstore too. So he heads back to the States. He's not doing very well on the East Coast, decides that, hey, I want to head west. And he was told, like, you know, there's a lot of Bohemians out west. It's a little like Paris. You'll really love it. And so that's what he did. When he came out here, he was walking along North Beach. Actually, he's driving along North Beach, and he sees this guy kind of like fixing something. And that's where City Lights Bookstore is now. And that man was Peter D. Martin, who had created a journal called City Lights, which at the time, there really weren't too many journals that had poetry and prose and artwork. And so he stops the car, gets out, runs over, and he goes, you know, I think we know each other. He says, I've contributed some Jacques Prévert translations to your journal. And they start talking, and then within a very short period of time, on a handshake and $500, they found this bookstore. Now, Peter Martin doesn't last more than a year, but once he's gone, he gets homesick for the East Coast and heads back. Lawrence buys the rest of the business from him, but then he realizes, wow, you know what I really want to do is have a publishing house and a bookstore. Because you also kind of get to control produ production, which was very, very important. But then he also wanted to create a space that was safe for people to have dialogue and to kind of enjoy each other's company, much like what he had experienced in Paris. And so all, all the way through the Hell trial and what happened in the 60s and punk rock, and there's this kind of long continuum. And we could spend probably two or three hours talking about all this. But I'm going to fast forward a little bit now and um, talk a little bit about this continuum and where I fit in. So uh, I originally come from theater. And I did spend a few years as a book buyer at another bookstore. And I was actually about to go into film, because I had also edited film. I was about to quit books, and then I got snapped up by City Lights. And it turned out they didn't have much of a calendar. And so one thing led to another. But then something happened in the interim, where uh, I think that you know, Ferlinghetti and the staff, everyone realized that you know, we could be doing something much more interesting. because. What we've already been doing in terms of curating the books, what if we did that with events? And it becomes this wonderful feedback loop between the books that we publish, but then also inspiring people, thinking about the ways in which different subjects kind of interrelate. So um, essentially, we're about community building. And what I do is bring people together. And you can kind of think of City Lights as being a kind of an alembic. Like if you want to think about alchemy and the way that you know, like different elements come together and then you know, they lead to something else. Um, but also a kind of a playground for ideas. And so what Fred was thinking about when he accused me of being a, a, a schizo curator was the fact that I was employing many of the techniques and many of the ideas that we were actually featuring. So whether it's surrealism, let's say something like automatic writing, or automatism, or the ulipo, where it's a, an offshoot of surrealism where they place constraints on your creativity just to see what will happen. Um, and so, and I do this actually, and I, I work with artists and with writers, and you know, we create these programs. And a lot of it is uh, very serendipitous. At times, it's a little scary, like you're never quite sure where a project's going to go. But, um, but there's this deep inquiry that is very rigorous, 
and uh, we're always kind of questioning ourselves and um, we have some really great partners and uh, so a lot of what we do is really about connecting people with each other and um, also we're meme busters I mean as you've seen already I mean you know it's like we like playing with words Lawrence for years has been making these little signs that he kind of posts around the store and it's always in response to things that are happening at large especially like when you know an autocratic force uh, begins sending memes out that really are, are intended to limit people's imagination uh, and so we are into re-engineering memes that's also a very big part of what we do um, we don't just deal in the avant-garde and in art and in literature we are also interested in politics and we're also interested in technology um, we're developing a project right now with our friends at the University of Sydney uh, there was a man who we worked with years ago on a Paul Virilio symposium and uh, he has created a project called Project Q which is about quantum technologies but he questions the ethics of what we're creating also um, questions what's happening socially to us when we create all of this convenience and sometimes it's not even convenient sometimes we're just kind of going with what we're told you know is the way forward um, and so Project Q and City Lights will be meeting in 2020 or maybe early 2021. Uh, we intend on bringing on many other partners, but it's not going to be simply an academic pursuit. What's important to us is we would also like to bring artists and writers and filmmakers into the dialogue and asking all the right questions. You know, what are the ethics behind the weaponization of physics? Uh, what happens when um, a big corporation enters a department of a university and begins pulling strings? Um, a lot of fun stuff too. Like uh, there'll be there'll be. Uh, I mean, it's not all heavy-handed. I mean, you know, we're we're um, going to have a lot of really gifted artists on board. I mean, Cal Spelatic was up there a second ago. Um, so there'll be a few others uh, that uh, have a bit of a sense of humor and can kind of add some levity to the whole thing. But um, so, you know, I'm trying to think now where I can go with this because, you know, we really have a limited amount of time. Um, I may actually open it up for Q&A now and just see what you would like to learn more about in terms of this process. Um, because I can talk about the minutia of it, especially in terms of, you know, because I know on the description of this evening that, you know, George Bataille comes into my mindset, uh, Guy Deleuze comes into my mindset, um, a lot of other people come in, and, uh, and it's as if, and Lawrence has used this as a quote uh, when he began the book story, he said, you know, City Lights is a kind of a place where the writers of the ages can engage in a conversation with each other and with the public. And so, um, and this is very, very important because being a spectator versus being a participant, that's part of what we're breaking down. And through a lot of these programs, what we've done is like, we've torn that veil down and sometimes whether you like it or not, and sometimes there are moments of discomfort, but uh, boy, it's a lot of fun. So um, I am here to answer your questions. Okay, first of all, thank you.